For generations, Ventura has thrived on the dedication and determination of extraordinary individuals, cultures, and families that guided and inspired our community. Family members from these pioneering families celebrate their remarkable histories by sharing captivating stories and personal memories. These are Ventura Legacies. Hi, I'm Suze Montgomery. Today we're doing Ventura Legacies and we're interviewing both Jim and Myron Harrison from E.J. Harrison's and Sons. So, going back to family history, who got here first, mom or dad? My mom. Mom? Okay, so she was here first and your dad came later. Yeah. So how did mom and her family get here? Mom's family came in with Father Sarah. Her great-great uncle was Captain Joaquin Moraga, which led the Father Sarah from mission to mission into California. Wow. So her mother was a Moraga. So my mother was here first, definitely. So she was born and raised here with the family. Born That's a long history. Yeah. Yep. Okay, Jim, when did dad get here? He came when he was 17 years old. He came from Idaho. He got a job down in the San Fernando Valley. He had got a job at Curse Castle. And he was, really? on, he was on his way up there to work. And I don't know, uh, I don't know exactly how he met my mom, but uh, he uh, met her and he uh, here in Ventura at the fair. And As history goes, mom was 15, 15 when she married old. dad. They got married when my dad was 21, so it took it was you know a little time went by. She said he never went on a date with my mom without a chaperone. Oh, I bet days. the old ways. Everywhere he went, he had her brother or her mother or somebody who was always with him. So uh, it was interesting what he was saying, you know. He went back and forth. Uh, he uh, he eventually ended up here in Ventura. Uh, over some time, I'm a little bit foggy on some of the time frames, but he uh, uh, didn't have any family here at the time. He was here by himself. That must have been kind of scary, though, in a certain sense. If you think about that, is a young age like that, a young man, with just starting out working. I think he was venturous. He was anxious to be here, happy to be here. Loved my mother's family because it was a big family. She had my, a lot of brothers and sisters, right? Yeah, there was nine of them, but my dad was really orphaned at 12 and wow. literally farmed out because they took the girls into the family, the rest of his family, but he ended up uh, being farmed out basically the rest of his life. When he turned 18, he picked up and came to California. That's, that's courageous when you think yeah. about it. That's really gutsy. Yep. So he got here, met mom, and at the Ventura County Fair, yep. great story. He followed her up, and there was the swings that were swinging way out. He was in line behind my mother and some of her family, and she was getting ready to ride in the, in the swing, and she didn't have any place to put her shoes. Well, he had on a suit jacket, so he says, give me your shoes, and he put them in his pockets, and that's how he met her. So did they often talk about those days oh, when yeah. you were kids? Sure did. So yeah. you grew up listening to their love story, basically. Exactly, exactly. You know Both how fortunate them. you guys are? <laughs> Both yep. of them were entrepreneurs, both of them were. My dad was a hard worker, my mother was a good manager. So they put it together and, and ran a, a good business. Started out teeny and, and grew up. Both of you went to local schools as well as Ralph did, correct? Right. Yes. You went all the way through the schools here together. Yep. And you have families, and we're gonna to get to that soon too. But when mom and dad started the business, if memory serve, it wasn't really, they weren't really looking at creating a dynasty. It just happened? It just happened. <laughs> How did, it st how did it start? My dad always says, find something that uh, nobody else wants to do and do it and do it well. Hauling trash, nobody wanted to haul trash. It wasn't as glamorous as it is today. And so that's, that's what he did. He just took on something that nobody else wanted to do and, and did it well. He just did it, start when he started, he obviously just started doing it by himself. Yeah. And then grew, he grew the business. Did he add like vehicles to the business to start creating it? He started out with a, cup, a truck that he called Chop Suey. <laughs> he had $7 in his pocket and he went to the junkyard and bought parts of what, eight or nine vehicles mm -hmm. and put them together and built himself a little pickup truck. And uh, he would go, people would see him cleaning up a guy's house and he'd go out in the back. In them days, it was ashes. Everybody burned everything. So he would shovel the ashes into each truck, charge the guy 50 cents, clean a big pile up and haul it to the dump. What year frame is this? This was, what do you say, 31? Okay, during the Depression. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Okay, so. 50 cents a day, it was a lot of money. It was, I bet it was. It was. And so pretty soon the neighbor would come out and say, hey, can you do that for me? And he'd say, sure. And then I don't know what year it was that Ventura City uh, started disallowing burning in the backyard. I, I don't know what year that was, but that was the boom. Everybody now needed trash service on a regular basis. So they were, your mom and dad were the only ones to actually put this together at that time? There was several. I think there was two or three different companies, but they so were you the survived. most aggressive. Yeah, it was the most aggressive, so. You know, you know down, in, uh, down in Ventura, corner of Oak and Main, that uh, the old bank building? Yes. That used to be the Bank of Italy at one time. That's what it was called. Janini. Bank of Italy. Yeah. My dad, my dad and mom had a, a rental out on the avenue, and uh, rent was probably four or five dollars a month or less maybe. My dad was out of work and he couldn't, uh, couldn't find a job. And so he walked from the avenue to this bank and he talked to the banker. And if you knew, if you knew him and knew all about him, he, he wanted to work not for money but for credit on the rent because they were handling the rent. And so he went out to see if there was something he could do in exchange for the rent. And uh, they couldn't think of anything and so my dad goes back home and then the banker walked up to the house and said they had some uh, houses, they were trying not to repossess houses during the depression, but they did, have, they did have some they were taking back. They needed someone to clean up the yards. So he went in there and he, uh, part of the job was cleaning them up, wash, you know, wash the walls, get them, get them ready to sell, cut the weeds, and there was trash to haul. So Myron said he built this truck, but that was a little bit later. He, my uncle was a plaster right here in Ventura. They built a trailer first, and they used chicken wire made a trailer and the, the dump in them days was right through where the Ohio Freeway is right now. Oh, no kidding. It used to be right there. It used to be a burn dump. So my dad, would, they would take that trailer to wherever my dad and my mom were working, because mom worked with him. She was out in the yard with him? Oh yeah, she worked with him. She always worked with him and she, uh, they fill the trailer up and at the end of the day, my uncle would come along and uh, they would take the trailer to the dump and dump it. And so someone one day stopped him and offered him 25 cents to haul something for him because he was going to the dump. And that's what started thinking about money. And he, because uh, he said he hadn't seen any money in a while. Can you imagine not, having no. seen work, working for credit? And so he started knocking on doors when he wasn't working for the bank. And uh, he was talking to us about how, how wonderful it was when he made 75 cents in a day. It didn't matter if he worked 10 hours, 12 hours, seven days a week, it didn't really matter to him. And I think in, in, he went back home to Idaho nine years after he left. 1938. So he, uh, I remember him telling me that he went back with the ledger book showing that he had grossed $100 in a month. Wow. And it, you got to remember the way that thought. Seven days a week, 12 hours a day, it didn't matter to him. And that's really the root of his success. He, he just did whatever it took to succeed. It had to be honest. He put the time in that it took to make things work. And that's, that's probably why he did so well. You know just I mean? true grit, number yeah. one, and then mom was the business manager. She was great. Mm -hmm. They worked side by side when there was no nothing to manage, but she was right in there with him all the time. What a great Even story. when we were young kids at, I don't know, kindergarten, we would go to the yard uh, after school and we would actually throw cardboard to the baler. My mother would run the office and we had a recycling yard in Ventura. Duber Street on the avenue. Yeah. So we'd go there and him and I would throw cardboard to the baler. My older brother would help bail, there was a worker's bailing. But in them days, we, the trucks were split in half and we recycled everything, yeah, just like they do today. But, but in nobody days, recycled was, in those days. Oh yeah, they did. Well, we recycled, did they? We recycled no, yeah. probably 50% at least in them days. But there was a market for it. What happened, the market dried up. All of a sudden, there was no market for that. Why do you think that happened? Uh, I, th I think it, it was- New yeah. manufacturer? It was too easy to get new stuff. Yeah, it was cheaper probably in the day. Nobody was uh, you know, directing it or trying to make it happen. But in the day, we used to bail everything, rags. Uh, we used to take the pots from behind, uh, like Mer no, what was the name of that, Maddox on Main Street, you probably don't remember it. But it was a, a restaurant and we'd pick up uh, big gallon cans. I mean, we would take those gallon cans and punch holes and spray them black and sell them to the nurseries for potting plants. Brilliant! And we used to save all the bottles. We used to save the rags. There wasn't much uh, aluminum in them days, you know, like tin right. can aluminum, but we used to save everything there was to save and then all the cardboard we build, newspaper we build, and, and we could drive it to market and sell it. 
Everything so, old is new again because that everybody's was, recycling that was again. The, that was in the 40s. So um, I think what he did was he taught Meyer mentioned rags. In them days, pe women were quilting. So my, they'd come to our house, my aunts and everything, and they would quilt in the garage, make blankets, you know. Right. And so they, they, they would get all the rags. And then my dad, my, my mother would wash all the cotton rags. And then my father would go sell the rags to the paint stores. And they, they would, because they would, they <laughs> would use great. them in. And then another thing that, and then my mother had all these, these other, other types of materials. You know, it wasn't too many different types in them days. But the people were quilting, were looking for wools and things, you know. So they, so they basically got rid of everything, and everything made a little tiny bit of money, you know, not a lot of money. And, and uh, he just sort of rolled with all the changes. Um, one of the things my dad did, if you look back in the, the, old, the company, Ventura, it used to be called Harrison Transfer. Oh, really? It wasn't called E.J. Harrison. And uh, what he was doing was he was using the truck to haul furniture. And then he was also collecting food, like people are doing today, and taking it to poor people. He'd go around to the restaurant with other people and collected food and, and distribute it to poor people. Long, long time ago before there was regular programs. And so he was, he was a visionary. Uh, he was a scout master too. So we also carried. You were the, all in scouts. Oh yeah, yeah. he was carried the scouts in the back of the truck. <laughs> in them days, you could do that stuff. We get all the scouts in the truck, yeah. throw all their packs in, and we'd haul us up and go camping. Did you think you were different when you were growing up, or did you think you were just like every other kid? I don't um, think we cared. <laughs> you didn't have time to think. I don't we're think too busy we worried working. About it. I really it don't. sounds kind of silly, but we kind of grew up in Southern California, but we really didn't because in the summer we worked. And then and, and you didn't ask you to work, and he, he might pay you if you had something, and if he didn't, the family's supposed to help. And so you just, Myron can tell you that. We, we didn't spend a lot of time with the California life because we were working all the time. And we'd be off on a holiday or Christmas or Thanksgiving. We all went out on the trucks and worked, see? So we're going to get home by 2 o'clock on Thanksgiving. And the whole idea was to get our whole family out there to get the work done so we could have, a, we could have Thanksgiving dinner. So everything was around work. And so freedom was getting all the work done. And I think uh, it was really a blessing, really, to get all, everything done, you had time. Without any, when things weren't done, you had no time. Your folks worked together. Yeah, I mean, totally. do you think it was because they met and married so young that they actually were responsible for raising each other to a certain degree? So they, what they agreed on, they were one family unit? I think my dad raised my mother because right. she was 15, he was 21, yeah. and so, I think by the time she was 20 or so, she was already had the same work ethics that he had, I'm and they sure. knew to get somewhere. They worked together, and they did until the day my dad passed away. They were just side by How side. How old was your dad when he passed away? 82. And your mom was 100? 99. 99. She was would have been 100 in about three months. Amazing parents. Yeah. I, knew, I never knew your dad, but I knew your mom quite well, and I was always. <laughs> At parties, I would seek her out and sit with her where everybody else is over there partying away. I would sit with Myra because Myra, the history, like you both remember the history, you're both really good at history. <laughs> so is your mom. She would relate stories. And we called her ambassador of goodwill in the last years of her life. My dad and mom would go together everywhere until my dad passed away. Then my mother just kept going everywhere, being involved in everything. And, and she was, everybody come over to see her, you know, because she was always involved with the business in town. And so we called her our ambassador of goodwill. Everywhere we took her, she was there meeting everybody and talking to everybody and, you know, right up to the end, you know, until, until she was 90. At 90, she had a bad stroke. <clears throat> and then she wasn't quite as good as she was before that. But she actually went five more years to 95 real strong and then started, of course, fading after that. But she instilled in you both love of community, which I, like, I've said this a couple times already, but I'm always, so impressed with the way that you take care of your community like you do your own families. Yeah, my dad always says, we need to help the youth, they're our future. So if we have anything to give away, let's give it to the youth. So we started out as a company was small, we would sponsor little league baseball teams. And then Jim was a coach, his son was all played ball, his son, my grandkids are coaches now in, in Ventura. We started out giving to the smaller operations, which we still do. And then as the company grew, we started giving to more to bigger, bigger operations like Boys and Girls Club, you know, Boy we've always, Some of the questions you're asking, we've asked ourselves the same questions. You know, I'll just give you an example. I, don't, I hope this doesn't sound mean. 
parents would sit there, we, all, we used to eat dinner together. Good we used to eat together. And I can tell you, my dad was there, my mom, my sister, my, you know, we had a ritual by your age, you know. Oh, they no would kidding. sit there and they would talk to us about saying your prayers. See? We had to go around, I didn't want to say doggone prayers. We had to go around and say your prayers at your turns, you know. He would tell you how unfortunate you were if you had no appreciation. And so he would talk, he did, his prayer didn't have to be anything very much, just appreciate your parents are alive, the good right. weather or anything. So this appreciation was fundamental. You had to appreciate. So this is the way they talked. Before you came to this earth, life got along around pretty good without you. you. You came here, and you're lucky to be here in the United States. We're lucky to be here. And until you pay your own way, and then you pay your own way, in other words, you're not a burden, and then you contribute. That's the ultimate. And then teach your children the same thing. And you and that, have. And that's it. That's the whole story. You come here, you pay your own way, you contribute to this, to this society, and you teach your kids to do the same thing. That's pretty basic. That's pretty basic. Yeah. And you still, and that's the way you live your lives today, too. That's the way we do right now. Yeah. And you treat your employees the same way. Your employees love you, by the way. I've, I've talked to many, when the guy comes to do my trash, I, how do you like your job? And the guy looks at me and goes, I like my job. And yeah. I go, no, why do you like your job? I like my job, I like what I do. Yeah. I like my people. Yeah. And it's always, he's appreciative of his job. How many employees can say that of their yeah. employers? Rare. They're usually just there to make the bucket leave. The How neat, fast can I get it done and go? The neat thing is on some of our employees, we, we have keep them forever. Yes. I mean, we have, this last year, I think we had three or four that retired, and some of them had 40 years. That's amazing in, in today's 35 world. years. This one individual, his name is Jose Aguayo. He worked for us 40 years. When he came, I'm sure he came from Mexico. Had seven kids and of course we'd meet his kids at the company barbecues every year right. and as years went on one day i'm in the esplanade and somebody goes mr harrison how you doing i'm looking at oh good uh, i'm sorry i don't recognize you he says well i've seen you at the company barbecue you haven't changed but i'm jose wild's daughter oh, and wow. uh, he says i'm going to go into college next year so when we gave him his 30-year ring, we have a ring, at, like a Super Bowl ring. How and cool! It's gold and it's really? Harrison, it's got the truck or whatever they, whatever they do for the company. And we asked him to say something. Well, he didn't make it to our dinner that year, so I caught him when he came by our office, and I made him come in the office, made all the girls in the office clap for him and everything. And I said, say something, what do you got to say? And he goes, well, I worked for the company 30 years, I love it, I came from Mexico. I'm in the land of opportunity. I have seven kids. They all went to college. I own my own home. I love my job. I don't know. What more wow. can you ask for? <laughs> yeah. That's the pinnacle. Exactly. I mean, what else? That's got it. got the American dream. Because. It is the American dream yeah. because we all came from somewhere else. Oh, yeah. You know, the Moragas, I mean, yeah, came, that's right. we came early, somewhere. early, early. <laughs> you know, yeah. something that we didn't say earlier was <clears throat> that my, uh, was really important to, to the family. We had a, my mother's family was a great family. They are yeah. just great people. They lived down, down where the freeway took the home out, but uh, there's lots of them, lots of cousins. We all met at Grandma's house, Hundreds. right on the avenue really? there. And uh, you couldn't all get in the house. The house was, there was so many people that we were out in the garden and out in the driveway. You could never get in the house because there were just too many people. All my aunts were there. They all loved us. My aunt could tell you, every one of them loved I don't know why they loved us so much. It was, <laughs> it was my mother, I think, telling them. Tell her how wonderful we were doing. We didn't think we were doing so hot, you know. And I think we're just a wonderful family. And I think my mom would say uh, that my dad adopted your dad, because my dad didn't have any parents, because they had my mom, they passed away when right. he was 12. They adopted my dad like he was their own son, which I think is just really neat. He adopted it is. my dad like he, so I think it's a really wonderful thing. That's you know? a good story. My dad's name is Elmo, Elmo Harrison. Didn't have a middle name. But when he met my grandparents, he didn't like the name Elmo. So he, he introduced himself as Jim. So my grandma called him Jim, Jimmy his whole life, or her whole life, I should say. So when my dad wanted to put, start a name for the company, he put E.J. Harrison. So he added that J for the Jimmy. He had no oh, that's a great story. <laughs> I always there's wondered no J, where like it came said, from. Only, you know, one thing was really kind of funny. They finally went to Europe. Uh, uh, they traveled over there, my mom and dad, and uh, it was kind of a funny story because uh, he found out that uh, there was no record that he'd ever been born. And, uh, <laughs> He had to, up in Idaho, because you know, they didn't keep good records. Born and raised So Idaho. he had to find an aunt, you know, a lot of them had passed away, who could remember that he was born. 
He made him a birth certificate, you know, so he could leave the country. No, because he had no record of him. So he's always and that was le they could legally do that. They legally did that. It was yeah. interesting, you know. Good old days. That was probably 35, 40 years ago. <laughs> this is what he said, though. He traveled all over the world, several, you know, all over the place. And he came, told me one day, I'm through traveling. He said, I'm through traveling. He says, uh, all I found out was what I already knew. What's that? We live in the best place. He said, this United States is about all the people. Things are made for everybody. A lot of beautiful things throughout the world, but they're, not, they're made for a few. In our country, everything's made for everybody. More of that, you know. He was a philosopher. Yeah, that's exactly right. He, he, saw, he saw what he saw. Well, he chose to see life in a certain way, which is a positive, meaningful way, which he instilled in both of you. Mm. He thinks you can work your way up. He wrote a lot of beautiful poems, too, in his life. Really? He was a poet. Yeah, he was. He actually did some stuff for the Starford Press a few times where he actually wrote something for him, like, I can't remember I'm that. I'm surprised you don't know about him because they've been around forever. I oh, don't yeah. remember. He wrote them in the 40s. I'm going to have to research these. Yeah. You guys are now instilled in me more. Yeah, I'm curious. Well, Mom wrote a book, Myra and I. I remember that. And it has a lot of, a lot okay, of so I'm, and stuff. Okay, so it, they put that yeah, in there as they, well. They have it at the county museum. I think they gave them one. And well, this, this piece here is going to go in the county museum as well. <laughs> well you the, guys are now the elders. <laughs> well, I think the, the, the key to happiness, this, I've, I've already said that earlier, he said the key to happiness is the ability to appreciate. Without, without ability to appreciate, nothing's going to make you happy. And you've instilled in you this know, in your families. The much. legacy goes on. Pretty much. Just both have just big families. You know, it doesn't have to be a big thing, just small thing. You know. My mother was one of 13 kids. That's amazing. My dad was one of nine. I have five kids, 21 grandkids, and 18 great-grandkids. Holy mackerel. What does a family reunion look like? How well, many do you have, Jim? You got to well, add have, to that? I have five kids, you know. You both I, have five? Yeah, I have, I have. That's interesting. I have 14 <laughs> grandkids. Then I have... About six or eight great grandkids. So when you have family gatherings at holidays, do you combine the families and have? We well, we do. Yeah, we have family or reunions. Or you rent out a whole big hall. Well, we at my them. house, my house, we just I, there's 55 of us, and so what we've done is, as the family grew, I have a very large dining room table. We made you it that way have. on purpose. But as as the kids got older, they were able to move to the bigger dining room table, and then. But in the last few years, seven or eight years ago, one of my grandsons came up and says, Grandpa, I'm uh, 30 years old. When do I, <laughs> get, to when do I get a move to the big table? <laughs> and I thought about it, and I thought, now on, we're going to have the, our Thanksgiving dinner and Christmas dinner in the patio because I could yeah. set up 50 of them. We set it up like an H so everybody could talk to oh, everybody. That's a good idea. And, and that's yeah. what we've done in the last probably 10 years. I, I am fascinated by your family. I'm going to do a lot more history on your family. I think I'm going to ask, I, I actually do another show. I'm going to ask you if you'll both come back and do my show at a later <laughs> date because I really want more stories and more history. You say you know my mom, but I would, I love I would go to her house to visit her and take one of my kids there. Kids don't visit like we did. Our, like Byron said, our old families, we all met at my grandma's, but we're not doing that anymore. You know, family's right. huge. And we're all spread around, but... Um, They'll, they'll see my kids, they'll talk to her, and then she'll say, is your, is your son working? They'll ask her, the boy, is your son working? No, not yet. What are you trying to ruin your kid? <laughs> Those are the kind of comments. There you go. I, this, is out of, this is out of grandma. Thinks everybody's supposed to work. Yep, have to work. <laughs> well, you know what? When you get to be a certain age, and you both will agree with this, you can get away with a whole lot more. That's and true. you can say things like that. Yeah, you're right. And you can just, because now you are the other older the, generation. You're the elder. They're supposed to listen to you. You can get away with a lot more. <laughs> exactly. I do the same thing. I sit at the end of the table, and in our house we have this thing, because everybody's got cell phones, right? Right. So we have a little basket by the front door on an antique table, and that is the cell phone garage. So they come in now, they're all trained, they put their cell phones in the basket. The only time you can take it out is if you're going to take a picture. Other than that, you're going to talk to each other. I think by what your parents did and what I'm doing with that is very similar. I want the conversation to continue. I want my children, you want your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren to know who they are and where they came yeah. from. This is the best legacy I think you can give anyone, right. is to let them know who you are and the, the family legacy and you're so proud of, and you yeah. should be. You've got every right to be so proud of your family. But I think that, I think, I don't, we don't know, we talk about it among ourselves, but I used to ride the city bus here in Ventura, 
and we, you know, a, lot, a lot of people were, were using the bus during the war, you know. And it was just common sense. If someone, some, somebody older person or a lady gets on the bus, you give up your seat. That's right, you move. Yeah. You were told, get the lady your seat. I mean, you were just around people that thought that way. Yep. And uh, they were consistent. They didn't, they didn't read a book and change. They, they were always the same. Yep. They just felt like that's what you're supposed to do. You open the doors. You know, huh? We huh? might have used the bus, but mom would give us a dime each to go take the bus and we'd get down to the bus stop. We lived on Evergreen in Ventura. And we'd look, we couldn't see the bus coming, so we'd just see, let's run to the next bus stop. So we'd take off running and run to the next bus to see the bus coming. Before you knew it, we For were all the way cents. downtown. And, and you pocketed the, the dime. <laughs> and we had the dime. And with that dime, I mean, you could go to the show and have a Coke and a there you go. popcorn. Did mom ever find out? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, no, you, you, yeah. About that. you better you better be because she kept track of you. So I think what <laughs> happened if there was some delay in the time, she'd be out looking for you. No kidding. Yeah, she's a policeman. She kept you in line. So my dad was very fortunate because uh, my mother, dad was gone so much that mom, whatever my mom and dad yeah. said, they both said the same thing. They worked together they in worked business together. and at home. Talk yeah. to one is just like talking to the other. Yeah. Well, Same. One day my mother got mad at Jim and I. I don't know what we were doing. But all the time. All the time. <laughs> and she'd say, go get me a switch. We thought about it a few minutes. I remember so that. We went into the garage and we got a two by four, about 18 feet long. And we both picked it up and carried it to her. She laughed so hard she forgot about whooping us. So we, were, we tried that again. It didn't work. Oh, it didn't it, work the next time. Yeah, they told us it only going to work So were you once. the rascal in the family then? Oh, he was terrible. Yes, he was. No, we were You turned out okay. Rascals. We were sneaky. Well, yeah, but all kids have to push. You never pushed the envelope, Larry? Sure, we did. But Constantly. you just never got caught. Well, he was older, so they'd get him, not me. We're 18 months difference in age. So You're they'd a lot alike. <laughs> but it's hard, it's hard to explain because, you know, I've thought about a lot. I just think about uh, I didn't do anything for it. Uh, I was lucky that they were my parents. I just, you know, we, you did, were, we yeah. get parents, so I was lucky they were my parents. Yes, you I've were. I've always felt very fortunate. Uh, they love you more than anyone you'll ever know. That's true. And so they have the best chance of disciplining you because they love you. They're yes. concerned about how you turn out. And I think anything else is not going to work as well. Someone that loves you, disciplines you, it's easier to learn that way. You know, you know And I right. think that it's, uh, beyond that, it gets tougher. And so I think with them, it was, uh, I look back at the life, I think about it quite a bit. Uh, we were just really fortunate. Boy, you were. I mean, you what a I mean? gift to have both of them together. Yeah. Yeah. And you're a gift, I think both of you are a tremendous <laughs> gift, not only to the community, but I'm so appreciative that you live in our town and continue to stay here. You could have gone somewhere else, but you're so invested in this town, yeah. and you learn that from the folks. That's right. And you continue to do that, and you're invested in your community, and you give back. Right. And all you guys are a gift. All, most, all of our kids are here, too. Oh, really? All Nobody of, moved? The only ones that, have, have, that are not here is the same ones the that sister. are the service. Yeah. Or, or Do they all come home? Well, most all my kids actually live in Camarillo. With that's great. So they're in town. So they're basically. all in town, and um, most of their kids are in town. And we have a few that uh, are out of the area, but very few. You know, maybe in the service. And Does Hawaii, anybody, kind of any thing. of your children, work for the business? Yeah, that's yeah. A, You know, one thing that's kind of a, you're talking about philosophy. This is a very basic thing. He would say, always do more than your share. When it comes to paying a bill with friends, pay more than your share. Don't ever pay less than your share. If you do that, it does something to you, paying less than your share. So he always said, Relax do more than your share. Else. Make sure, always do more. Don't, don't, if, you, if you're going to go with a friend somewhere and you can't pay your way, don't go. Wow. You know, don't let other people pay your way. Just don't go. And know? They, they, you know, when they tell you that, you'd watch them in their life, and that's just exactly what they did. They modeled did. it. Exactly mm -hmm. what they did. So you, you knew it was the right thing to do because you could see you know, how people acted around them, that they always took care of themselves and did more than their share. You know, it's amazing that you both have never forgotten your roots. You both live uh -huh. your roots. You both are great friends besides brothers. And how much, I keep thinking how lucky we are as a community to have you Well, I wish there. my brother Ralph was here because, you know, I mean, we're all, he's like us or we're like him. So he just happens to be out of town today. Well, thank you for joining us today. I'm honored to have you in my life and also in the community. Thanks well, thank for you. being thank here. You. What a treat much. to have you.